apologize for the confusion in the uh, uh, schedule. Apparently, a lot of folks three, me, myself included, which is why I'm on time. Because if I had known it was at 3.30, I'd be here about 10 minutes. Um, so I want to thank you guys all for coming in. And we have a much better, uh, more filled room, I should say, than what I saw 15 minutes ago. So we thought we just wait to get started. Um, I am presenting to you an update on the bionic pancreas. And this is my 11th such update at this venue. So I first came here in 2007, a decade ago. I was a younger man, my kids were younger, <laughs> and um, we have uh, had a lot of progress over the years. And we, I just love to, to share the updates here um, every year, and in particular, I like to see this as kind of, um, this is a goal for us, this, this July meeting. We try to get a lot done to show you all our progress every year because you, know, you guys have been all uh, intimately involved in our productivity and our progress and in helping us get here with all the donations and support, emotional, financial, that you guys have given us over the years, we really appreciate it. And uh, I'd love to be accountable to this group more than So we really uh, love to come here. And uh, we now have a booth at, uh, at Friends for Life. We've had one for a few years running. I think uh, we had our first booth in 2014, but we were just at Boston University at the time. The clinical trials with MGH and Stanford and a couple of other clinical sites. Um, but we started a company, as you probably, many of you probably know, uh, about 18 months ago called Radio Lines. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about that company, the, how we're doing, and uh, how we're growing, and what our plans are, as well as uh, update on clinical data, uh, new clinical data since the last time we met. And of course, I'd love to update you with uh, our progress on the Islet Bionic Macro System and Islet Infusion Set. And um, this is the best place to do that. So we'll show you the stuff that we do. Uh, but before we get started on all that, I'd like to give you an update on David. Because this is the reason I got involved in this uh, whole problem. That's David um, just before he got his driver's license. So that's David just before he got his driver's license. That's David, I think, in the first grade. And this is by David. I think this is David in the 12th grade. I think this is first grade. So it's kind of nice to poke at to his primary and secondary school years. And um, David was diagnosed uh, by my wife, who's a pediatrician, with type 1 diabetes when he was 11 months old. So we've seen uh, type 1 now for 17 years. He's an 18-year-old uh, young man, and uh, he is going to college in 50 days at Boston. So I'm very happy to that. I'd like to be able to say that he's going to work one of our devices, but he's not. Uh, we, you know, we shot for this target uh, about 17 years ago, <laughs> and uh, we missed the target a little bit, and uh, I'll explain some of the reasons why, but uh, we're just going to press on and do our best to, to um, you know, to bring that timeline in as best as we can, but we've made tremendous progress, and we're doing much more than I ever thought we would, we would do or would have to do to bring something like this to, to millions of people with type 1. So, um, to give you a sense of scale, well, something would happen. Uh, just to give you a sense of scale, that's David and myself next to Half Dome uh, a few months ago. So um, that's sort of a geological perspective on him, but he's somewhere between down and between me and Half Dome. Uh, this was uh, about um, a couple weeks ago. It was a really nice height we had. This is a uh, panorama point that uh, Mike Rosenko told me was the place. So that's David, and he's off to college, and he's doing great. He's getting his braces off next week, and, uh, and we're really happy. So, um, I want to still talk about getting this technology out to David as soon as possible to other people, everyone knows about the type of diabetes, other people have two diabetes. So, uh, let's talk to you about how that's going to come about. Um, and again, I keep hitting it. I think I'm not even going to use this thing. Um, so, we're going to talk today about our biopancreas system, and a lot of what we're going to talk about comes from clinical data that we've collected over um, about eight or ten years with our collaborators at MGH and at uh, Stanford University, University of North Carolina, Carolina Chapel Hill, and University of Massachusetts Medical Center um, over the years. 
Uh, but all that data came out of a bionic pancreas system that evolved from a laptop system to a system that ran on an iPhone, and that was all collected in the academic setting. So everything we're talking about is really all this clinical data is coming from that platform, not from clinical trials that we've done yet with bionics. So there's two we's here. There's the Beta Bionics we, and then there's the Boston University we. So I just want to make it clear that the, the iOS itself is an investigational device. It's a device right now that is not approved for use in clinical trials yet. Uh, hopefully it will be in, uh, in a few months uh, to begin our first bridging studies with this device. But it is going to contain all the mathematical dosing algorithms that we've been developing over the years. Um, it's going to be integrated in firmware, or already is integrated in firmware in this device. So the challenge was to take this kludgy iPhone system, which I'll show you in a minute, with a couple of tandem pumps and a Dexcom sensor integrated into this very uh, awkwardly uh, configured system that you put in various pockets and pouches. But it was a mobile system that allowed us to get really good clinical outpatient data in the outpatient setting, summer camp settings. So we integrated and embedded all that into firmware on this device. And we like to call this device the eyelet in homage to the eyelets of Langerhans that secrete insulin and glucagon. The pancreas, um, the, well, the, the cells that are collected there, uh, it is a dual hormone system. So it's got both an insulin chamber and a glucagon chamber. But this is a fully integrated system. It does not require smartphone technology. It doesn't depend upon um, PCs or tablets or, lap or, or, or iPhones or smartphones. It's a standalone device like an insulin pump is, but it will communicate with smart devices. So it will be connected um, to, the cloud, to a cloud service through, uh, through an iPhone or through a smartphone. So we're building out that platform as well. But this is truly an integrated system, and so uh, hence the tagline, carry your glucose metabolism in your pocket. You really can put this thing in your pocket. It's totally standalone, independent of internet as well. Um, but just to uh, roll the tapes back a little bit, I want to just, for those who are unfamiliar with what this is, a bionic pancreas, in this case a bionic bionic pancreas, is a system that consists of three medical device technologies integrated into one, plus, of course, important drug technologies, insulin or insulin analogs, and glucagon, glucagon analogs, or glucagon analogs. So it consists of a continuous glucose sensor, which transmits data, CGM that you're all familiar with, transmits data to um, the receiver unit in this little brick that we've been using. Um, for all these past four or five years, an iPhone system that is connected to that receiver unit that then collects the data and every five minutes makes a dosing, automated dosing decision as to how much insulin or glucagon to dose every five minutes. So it's continuously giving little tiny doses or larger doses as needed every five minutes. And it's a fully autonomous system in the sense that it automatically delivers insulin and glucagon without the need for input from the, the person wearing the device. And it also then communicates down to the way it delivers those drugs is through subcutaneous infusions and standard insulin pumps. And this older system that we're retiring uh, communicated with two tandem T slim pumps. One delivered insulin and one was repurposed to deliver glucagon. And in all our trials with this system, except for one, we have uh, been using the Lily Rescue glucagon as the second one. We've also tested this device in other configurations because, of course, it has a very important role as an insulin-only system as well for people potentially with type 2 diabetes or insulin therapy. We think that uh, they could benefit potentially from this technology. So we've begun uh, in collaboration with uh, Steve Russell and MGH do some preliminary studies in people with type 2 and has some encouraging results. So we're going to try and get some resources to do that as well. Uh, but it also is a glucagon-only system. And by the way, the insulin-only system we think is going to work very well. We have good support for that. Uh, the insulin bionic bio pancreas system has shown good results in uh, people with uh, type 1. The, the glucagon is an improvement. Uh, they're, they're able to get better mean glucose levels and even less hypoglycemia and be more physically active and more spontaneous. So we see that as also a stepping stone. The insulin-only system is a stepping stone to the bio. But we also have a third configuration of the system, and that's a glucagon only system. That's for people who don't have diabetes, but they have other disorders, other disorders of chronic, for example, chronic hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia, things like congenital hypoinsulinism, born that are secreting too much insulin, and they become very hypoglycemic. And then you also have people who have insulin syndrome, metastatic tumors, that are secreting a lot of insulin. They don't have a diagnosis of diabetes, but they have a terrible problem. And it's an orphan disease where this is really not a great therapy 
for these people. So we see an opportunity here to come in and help them. So we see this as a sort of three devices in one. Uh, so this is the closed loop, though. And our device is really, uh, we think, unique. Our technology is unique in that it's initialized only with your body weight. And we think this is an extremely important distinction from anything we've seen before. We don't require to initialize our algorithms that you tell it what your total daily dose is that you tell it what your basal infusion rates are or your carb to insulin ratios. That whole lexicon is being, we're, we're dispensing with that. We're not asking people to know how to do that anymore because it's not a skill set that you should need to maintain if technology exists that can unburden you from having to worry about that. And that's what this is about. It's about a device that you can type in your body weight and it'll come online and it'll automatically weight with you. And all the studies that we've done, all the clinical data I'm going to show you in the next few minutes, is built on that premise and it was all initialized with every subject's body weight, not knowing whether they're a teenager, an adult, or not. So, it, you know, a preteen, it doesn't ask those questions. So, this is a technology that can literally be prescribed by primary care physicians, not just subspecialists, not just endocrinologists and dietologists, the device that a pediatrician uses. There's nothing to adjust, there's no way to go back and adjust insulin dosing. The device is autonomous. It's autonomous in the sense that it automatically controls blood glucose. It still needs to be maintained. It's still a clumsy, kludgy thing. It's got tubes and sensors and things poking into your skin, batteries that need to be recharged. It's got all those, those that, that, that burden, but that's a maintenance burden. It's not a management. It's not a continuous, relentless management. So we see them as very different things. Um, these are the components of this old system that we're going to be retiring. Uh, we've been using it now since the beginning of 2013. Prior to that, we actually had this thing running instead of on an app on an iPhone, we had this thing running in that lab on a laptop. So it was even more cumbersome. And all those studies, about four and a half years of studies, were done in the inpatient setting at Master's General Hospital, both in adults and teenagers. So there's a long history here because before you go, when you go back before the inpatient studies, you're talking about three years of pig studies, which we did for years. The first presentation I gave here in 2007, I was showing a smaller group of, of you folks data um, that we collected in a, in a swine model. We did that for about three years before we could get enough data to go to the FDA. And how many kids were right in the laptop system for humans. And then four years later, we built out the system where we go to the So what I'd like to also point out is, as I like to say, this is a conference where we like to present new things, where we present new timelines. And, and this is one of those timelines I put on the table back in 2000 and um, 12, I believe it was at Fresh for Life, so five years ago. At that time, I had a view for about four studies. One was yeah, back then called the Five Day Study, which uh, my clinical collaborator Stephen Russell happily renamed the Beacon Hill Study because that's where it was done. Beacon Hill neighborhood of Boston. We had in mind to do two summer camp studies. We ended up doing the first one in adolescence at the Camp Jocelyn and Claire Barber Camp in Central Massachusetts. And the second one was done in that same venue in preteens, kids 6 to 11 years old, uh, in the summer of 2014. And then we did a, a multi-center home use study of the device, whereas the Beacon Hill study was a study done in a hotel type setting. They slept in a hotel every night for five days and five nights. And they could walk around Boston, a three square mile area. The multi-center study, they literally got to live at home, they could drive their car, they go back and forth to work, they could carry on their normal routine. Um, they had to live with it. They had to stay within a couple of hours of, the, of these various centers where we conducted the trial. But other than that, there was no restriction in any of these studies on diet or exercise. They could be as vigorous as they wanted. All four of these studies were bi-hormonal studies. And for those of you who have seen these data before, please just bear with me. But for those of you who you have it, uh, I would like to just sort of show you how to read these plots. What you see here is data from that first summer camp study in teenagers, 12, 20 years old. The second summer camp study, 15 to 6 to 11 years old. And the third, the, the, the home use study in adults, 18 and older, these were 11 day experiments, whereas the camp studies were five day experiments. And each of these studies were randomized crossover trials. So the subjects were five days or 11 days on their own insulin therapy, insulin therapy and five <coughs> days, or in, or in the case of the home use study, 11 days on the pancreas in random order. So either you randomized first to home use, uh, uh, home use of the pancreas, or you randomized first to your usual care that you crossed over. So each subject served as their own control in this study. And what you see here is each line represents data from each subject in each of these three trials. The endpoints of the lines on the left of these, of these plots correspond to the mean glucose each subject achieved on their own therapy. And 
and the endpoint of each of these lines on the right show you the mean of these subjects achieved uh, on the bionic pancreas. And the size of the circles at the endpoints of these lines tells you how much hypoglycemia they have. Because obviously we all know it's easy to manage diabetes if you could just overdose it. Right. You just pump tons of insulin, people are going to have blood sugar, and things, but that's going to be easy to manage. But there are you know, consequences to that, obviously. It's kind of contraindicated in severe hypoglycemia. So the alternative would be very easy to manage diabetes, we just cut the insulin down so that people were getting uh, low levels of insulin, their blood sugars were running high all the time. Of course, that has long term complications. So it's threading the proverbial needle that's so hard. So showing clinical data that only reports mean glucose or time and range without telling you how much hypo is missing an important and essential ingredient to characterizing how well the system performed. You've got to be able to address and minimize both mean glucose. So this shows that that co-primary endpoint of all of our studies is mean glucose and hypo. All in one graph, the size of the circle study, how much hypo each subject had, and the smaller circles mean, meaning less hypoglycemia. This would be 1%. And of course, the endpoints of the lines tell you the mean. So what you see is the mean glucose in the preteen, in the teens, the preteens, and the adults are all around 140 mg per deciliter with our bihormonal system. Plus or minus about 10 mg per deciliter. Whereas the usual care is a higher mean glucose with a standard deviation of around plus or minus 30. So it's about three times much more intersubject variability on standard pump therapy than there is on the pancreas. And realize that all these subjects in all these studies are uber users. They're self-selected group of really well-controlled people with type 1 diabetes. And by that, I, I, you can see that basically by looking at the mean glucose on usual care, 162, 168, 158. Those, of course, run to A1Cs in the sevens, low to mid sevens, right? In the U.S., the, the, the mean glucose out there, the mean A1Cs is quite a bit higher than that. It's more like the, the, around mid, mid, mid 8%. So these subjects are actually doing better than, um, than the standard of care out there if you look at it in the population as a whole. But nevertheless, the device is doing better by reducing mean glucose in a significant way and reducing hypoglycemia. Down to levels at camp, which are around 1%, 1.2, 1.3%. And in, in home, in the adults, it was more like about 0.6 to 1%. So there was, it was dramatically reduced hypoglycemia. 0.6% of the time below 60 mix is like 8 minutes out of the day. And even when the device does dip down below 60, it drinks it like that. It's proactively treating the hypoglycemia. It's turned the insulin off maybe an hour or more earlier, and it's proactively rebounding your blood sugar or attempting to by dosing small microdoses. So, um, nevertheless, this is a very small amount of hypoglycemia given how autonomous the system is and how well it works across all these subjects, knowing nothing more about any of these subjects than their body mass. It comes online and it begins to adapt to your ever changing and converges on what your, roughly what your average total daily dose of insulin is in roughly about a day or so. So we've, we've learned that in our inpatient studies. These papers were all published in a variety of manuscripts. Uh, the summer camp study, the Deacon Hill study, were published in the Milling Journal of Medicine about three years ago. Um, the preteen summer camp study was published in the Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology um, about a year ago, a little over a year ago. And then uh, the Lancet, uh, we published the uh, multi study in the Lancet earlier, uh, at the end of 20. Um, the other thing I want to just point out is, so these are the manuscripts I was just talking about. If you want to learn more about these studies, go into the, dig into the weeds a little bit. This is available on our website at, at betabionics.org or at bionicpancreas.org. You can go to either one of those websites and you can download the papers. And all of our manuscripts include online supplemental information. So you can go look at the actual subject level data. I think we're the only group I have, we've encountered in the space that is really committed to showing all subject level data. So if your your kid is in one of our studies, or uh, you are one participated in one of our studies, when the paper is published, you can go to the online stuff and you can see all the data that we collect. It's readily available publicly for everyone to look at. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the insulin only configuration and the glucagon, just only only very briefly. But it's important because, as I mentioned before, the glucagon part of this is extremely important for people with type 1, but it might not be necessary for people with type 2. Um, and of course, um, early adopter type 1s are going to really like the, type, the, the insulin-only system. It's going to be far superior. Well, from these data, we see that the insulin-only system that we've tested is far superior to, uh, to usual care 
Um, of, you know, and again, very well cooled control set of cohort. Same kind of plot you see here. This is taking the exact same device, initialized only with body weight, the same kind of autonomy as our biomolecular system affords. But there's no glucagon. You basically turn the glucagon off. Not only is this important from the standpoint of bringing a technology like this out to people with type 1 diabetes, people with type 2 diabetes potentially, but it's important because whenever you have a failure in the system, you want to have tested the, the, the fallback. So if we lose glucagon, you run out of glucagon on the ground about, you have an occlusion on the glucagon side, the device will, will back off in its dosing uh, posture and give a little bit less insulin, be a little less aggressive, and get you to a, a sort of a, this kind of a configuration of our insulin only system. So it's baked right in to our device. When I say it's three devices in one, I mean that you know the device has all that, that those three configurations built right into the same device. It's not three separate devices, so you can configure that dual hormone, the dual chamber system in any one of these three three ways. But here you can see the meat glucose for this study we did was with Bruce Buckingham at Stanford was about 160 mix per so They were supposed to have about 140, which is what we saw with the bihormonal system. And uh, the, the, again, the, mean, the standard deviation on the mean was plus or minus about 10 mix per deciliter versus plus or minus 25 or 30 mix per deciliter on, for the uh, cohort as a whole. Uh, but the hypoglycemia, again, is about 1% of the time versus about 2% of the usual care. So again, we had a statistically significant reduction in hypoglycemia. Not as dramatic as what we saw with the bihormonal system, of course. And this is a system that will require more attention for doing people when you're physically active. You're not going to get mean glucose levels of 140 without dramatically increasing risk of hypoglycemia. Um, here's another study that's really uh, very interesting. Oh, by the way, the results of that, for that insulin-only study, we were looking at different glucose targets. So by adjusting the target, we can adjust how much insulin it's going to give and what your mean glucose will be. Um, that target was, was higher, it was our 115 mg per deciliter. We've looked at 130 mg per deciliter, depending on the subject. We've also looked at, uh, in a very systematic way, at what we, what we call the set point study that Stephen Russell recently finished at MGH, that looked at the bionic pancreas in both the insulin only and bihormonal configuration and different glucose targets. A lowest target for bihormonal was lower than the lowest target for the insulin only system. This is a really interesting stu study that Stephen Russell did with his team using our system, turning off, using the BU uh, bionic pancreas system, turning off the insulin. Uh, insulin arm of the device. So here, it only dose of glucagon. These are people who, are, who had type 1 who were hypoglycemic unaware. And they got to wear the, the glucagon only uh, configuration of bionic pancreas for 14 days and nights at home, at home you say. They managed their own insulin therapy. It was not closed loop. They managed their insulin therapy. Uh, most of them had sensor augmented pump therapy. But you still see the same large standard deviations, both on the glucagon only or the control group. Plus or minus about 30 weeks because they're dosing their own insulin and they're with all the foibles that that process has that's baked into these results. But what you see is a dramatic reduction in hypoglycemia in these people from 4.7% of the time below 60 weeks because they're all the way down to one2 And all that's happening here, the device can't turn off the insulin, it can't control the insulin, it has no control over it, but it's able to get glucagon, these micro doses of glucagon in exactly the same way the bihormonal system would do. Um, so we've got all that automated fluid on delivery. You can see a huge reduction in these hypoglycemic unaware people uh, just by simply looking up the glucose on the automated portion of the system. And you would, of course, do for better still if you were to add an automated insulin delivery. What I should also emphasize here is this fourfold reduction that you see in hypoglycemia 24-7 in this cohort. If you looked at just the amount of hypoglycemia reduction there was in the same cohort overnight, it was 19-fold reduction in hypo by just giving automated. So this was in a type 1 population, but Stephen Russell has since done studies where his team looks at uh, preliminary studies of hypoglycemia in people with um, post-bariatric surgery patients. Some subset of them have hypoglycemia after surgery. And so he's, he's tested the, glu the glucagon-only version of the system in that population as well. And he's also looking at uh, starting a study uh, this fall in these little children who have, um, who have uh, congenital hypoglycemia. So this is sort of a look at the three configurations of the system, but um, I would like to emphasize uh, these data because these are new data, and this is a study that uh, Stephen Russell was deemed in in a period of six weeks. They had two providers, so Stephen was on call every other night, and this was a heroic effort on the part of his team. They did the study in six weeks in 23 subjects, 
And I don't think either him, him or his fellow, pediatric endo fellow, had more than an hour and a half sleep in any window for six weeks every other night because they were on the call every night and they were just getting phone calls all night long. Because the device that we use to get to the study is this iPhone system and it's all this Bluetooth communication between the pumps and the phone and it's beeping all the time. It's a clumsy system and he'd get phone calls for you know, troubleshooting these things and he had to take all that. So they did the study, it was a heroic effort, but here's the way the study played out. These experiments were five days long, kind of like the Beacon Hill study and the summer camp study. Five days, five nights, it was a home use setting. Um, these were adults wearing the insulin only or five mm system with their usual care. So these two, these two uh, panes here correspond to usual care. The blue panes correspond to insulin only via pancreas, and the green panes correspond to five mm only via pancreas. And what we wanted to do here, something I don't think anybody's ever looked at, is the effect of, of remote telemetric monitoring for hypoglycemia. We are, we've always been watching our subjects every five, you know, every continuously for hypoglycemia during these trials. And the reason we've done this, and we, we, we felt the need to do this study, is because ultimately, um, you know, ultimately our system is very autonomous. And to remove all remote monitoring is, is, is something that we shouldn't take lightly. So we really thought, well, this is not something the FDA asked us to do. This is something we brought to the FDA saying, we think this is an important study. And our hypothesis was that this remote monitoring we're doing for hypoglycemia, we're applying it equally in usual care as we are in the intervention car, whether it be insulin only, glucagon only, or biomolecular. But the, the reality is that we suspected that the, the, those that were, the, 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 the arm that was benefiting most from the remote monitoring was the usual care, as you might expect. Whether we did remote monitoring or not, we weren't sure we were going to see a difference on the bionic pancreas, whether it was insulin only or biomolecular. But we thought that the people on usual care, when they were on their usual care arm, they were benefiting from these phone calls telling them that they were low or high or whatever. We really were only tracking for hypoglycemia in the study and not device connectivity. But the, the Y in the end correspond to no monitoring or yes with monitoring. So what you see here is in the biomolecular arm, there's really no difference in mean glucose, 139 mg per deciliter plus or minus. Uh, about 10 mg per deciliter, 11, 13 mg per deciliter, 1% of the time below 16 mg per deciliter. Very similar amount of glucagon usage. Uh, if you look at usual care, the mean glucose jumps up from 1, 140 to about 150, with about 1.6, 1.7% of the time below 16 mg per deciliter. Total daily dose of insulin is, is insignificantly different. There's no difference in the mean glucose or the standard deviation around the mean. But then you see this difference here in the control arm, where the mean glucose didn't change, 165 mg per deciliter, plus or minus about 30 mg per deciliter again, but you have more hypoglycemia when you, when you turn the monitor off. As expected, the arm that benefited from our remote monitoring was usual care, and there's a statistically significant difference in that hypoglycemia that usual care got when monitoring was turned off relative to the vitamin. So you're seeing a reduction in hypoglycemia and a reduction in mean, whether there's monitoring or not, in, uh, in the biomolecular system. Usual care, we're also seeing a reduction in mean glucose, not a significant reduction in hypoglycemia, but there was no difference between insulin only by our pancreas system, whether we were watching them. And you expect that of an autonomous system. It's not, it doesn't care if you call them up, it's, it's, it's taking care of you. But this is something we felt the need to do because we want to remove remote monitoring for all future studies, or most, most we just essentially all the studies going forward, we want to get rid of this monitoring. We'll probably have one more study with remote monitoring roll out our first experiments with the island, just the platform. But then with, on the strength of these data, we feel pretty, pretty comfortable that we're moving remote monitoring because we're not, we're not exposing uh, any risk in these uh, the, the biopancreas arms to risk. It's only the usual care arm that was. I also want to update you on the glucagon story. This has been an unfolding saga over the past years because the question I frequently get is, is there a stable glucagon? I mean, the glucagon we've been using in all these biohormonal studies is our rescue kit glucagon that we carry around and keep in our, our, our kitchen. It's this, this lyophilized substance that you have to mix at the point of care, and you would do that in an emergency. But what we've done is gotten an agreement by the FDA to use that drug as long as we reconstitute it in these studies on a daily basis. So every 27 hours, we have to reconstitute it and we do change the cartridge you know, on the glucagon side. That's how we've been doing these experiments because the lily glucagon isn't chemically stable. It has no path forward. The lily or the novo recombinant glucagon, the rescue glucagon, has no commercial path forward um, for widespread use in this application. It's not that glucagon is not stable in water. 
So there's been a number of companies that have, have made efforts at stabilizing glucagon, and, and a few with, with a good degree of success. Viadel was the first company we started talking to. Uh, they're, they're not in business anymore. They also had a rapid insulins, but their they're glucagon, they came up with a way to stabilize the human glucagon molecule. Uh, and that, that turned out not to work very well, so we moved on and we started working with Xeris. And Xeris has a very interesting technology where they stabilize the glucagon molecule in a non-aqueous uh, non excipient. It's called dimethyl sulfoxide. And that seemed very promising too. I think it's going to be a, has a real good potential for a rescue drug. But the problem there was that it wasn't stable uh, with siliconized glass cartridges. And we need to put this thing in a glass cartridge. We're designing an integrated platform that's easy to and a platform where we want to make it, make it impossible to cross-channel drug. These are two drugs that have exactly opposite effect on it. You cannot get it wrong. You have to make it impossible to get it wrong. You have to design a technology platform where you cannot put glucagon in person. So one way to assure that, it, or, or to help assure that, is to, is to make sure that the glucagon cartridge is You're not transferring drug from a vial into a cartridge, and that cartridge fits only and then we have other design features built in to further prevent and mitigate any possibility mechanically of cross-channeling the drug. But that was something we didn't see a path forward with the Xeris product, but we did see with the Zealand product. So Zealand Pharma is a, is a, it was an outcropping of Novo Nordisk. They're at Copenhagen, and they're a pharmaceutical company, that biotech company that makes these molecules, uh, and they've come up with a glucagon analog that is stable in aqueous solution, pH neutral aqueous excipient. So it's very much like the, the insulins we're using. It's not the human glucagon molecule, the amino acid sequence has been changed, and as a consequence of that, it still binds to the same receptors in the liver that the human glucagon molecule does, but it's stable in water. So it's just like Lispro and Aspar, Humalog and Novolog. Those, those drugs are not the human insulin molecule. They've also made a change to the amino acid sequence, and that's, that, that is a stable molecule in water, but it's also more rapidly absorbed than regular human insulin. So that was, a, that was, again, a biotechnology, a huge biotechnology leap in 1995 when Lilly came out with Humalog, and two, five years later when Novo no Nordisk came out with Novolog. Similarly now, there is a glucagon analog that Zeeland has developed, which is analogous to the human insulin analogs of Lilly and Novo Nordisk, which is stable in aqueous pH neutral solution. It has very similar stability profile to the insulins. Many, many months in the supply line under refrigerated conditions and many weeks um, in under uh, near body temperature. So perfectly applicable to pump usage, just like the insulin analogs we've been using today. And we began a collaboration of beta ionics with Zealand Farm at the end of 2015, right after we incorporated. And since then, we've made great progress developing the island technology in concert with their drug development efforts and their cartridge containment efforts. We work together on designing this little cartridge, the last cartridge that would contain the drug. And we've already, did, uh, we talked about a year ago, I believe, I announced, uh, it, was, yeah, it was June of 2016, Beta Bionics and Zeeland had a joint press release talking about these two phase 2A studies that we wanted to do. One was done entirely by Zeeland to look at the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of their glucagon analog in, in microdoluses in tiny doses, similar to the doses nearly as small as the doses of ionic tankers gives on a, on a daily basis. And that study was done by Zeeland, and it had some input from Stephen Russell on the design of that trial, and they published top-line clinical results uh, of this at the ADA meeting uh, last month, San Diego. And they got very uh, compelling results that showed uh, this is a first-in-class glucagon analog, uh, but this data showed that the toxic glucagon increased blood glucose levels across all the doses tested just in the same way that the lily glucagon Rescue the, the, you know, the human recombinant rescue group. And there, these, these small doses were safe and well tolerated, just as we found uh, is typically the case with the rescue group we guys were giving small doses throughout the week. But in addition to that, we had this, um, oh, I guess, I, I think I'm going to just, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on a little bit. Um, but there was a second study that we did um, that, that, that that was done with the Boston University of Bionic Pancreas System. Again, using the Zealand glucagon um, in the bionic pancreas and comparing it to the bionic pancreas using the old Lilly rescue kit that we've been using all these years in a small eight-hour study in people with type 1 diabetes. 
And there we challenged the system by making them hypoglycemic as much as we could. We overdosed them with insulin, so it was giving them lots of challenge. And again, we found that there was, uh, there was no statistically significant difference in the amount of glucagon, in, in the effect that that glucagon had in raising blood sugar, whether it was the Zealand product or the Louis product. So we, we've seen a great opportunity here for a true, uh, a true glucagon, stable pump of glucagon analog that has a commercial path forward. And these clinical results are the first uh, real indication of that promise. And so we're going to be moving forward with a phase 2B study, which I believe I talked about first for like a year ago. And that study we'd like to begin uh, in the first quarter of next year. We'd like to submit the uh, application to the FDA for review to do that study in the fourth quarter of this year. So we're really excited about this, this new glucagon opportunity. There are other big pharma interests in, in making pumpable stable glucagon. So we're really encouraged about the interest that's being drawn uh, to this particular this particular year. So just to, to summarize, these, these studies here in, in gray are studies that we finished. Um, and there's almost 10 studies here, these two summer camp studies, Deacon Hill, multi-center study, and so on. These were done in collaboration with uh, our clinical partners at MGH at Stanford, UNC Chapel Hill, the University of Massachusetts Medical Center, the Claire Barkham camps. They were all done on this iPhone platform, and all the data I've shown you today comes from that platform. Um, What's the, what we're having uh, our focus on now are these studies going forward that are all going to involve this pilot platform that I talked about at the beginning. So this, this is a technology that I said is totally integrated. We want to use this, this uh, stable pump of glucagon product in it. And um, we're really interested in getting these two studies started. I was hoping to be, you know, in the second half of this year into the pivotal trials. And where we are, in fact, right now is, is getting warming up for these, what I'm calling bridging studies. And we call them bridging studies because it's bridging from that iPhone technology to the final, the studies we did, these feasibility studies we did with the iPhone platform into the final, what's called pivotal trials of the pilot. So these studies are going to be the bridge to that final pivot, those final pivotal trials. A pivotal trial for the insulin-only system and another pivotal trial for the bioremol system. At some point, we'll also have to do some kind of a pivotal trial for the glucose as well. Um, but our goal now is to do this insulin-only bridging study where we look at the island in the insulin-only configuration and we'd like to submit that application in, this, in the third quarter of this year. So this quarter, we'd like to submit that application to the FDA so that we can begin that study in adults first in the fourth quarter of this year, and then we we'll have pediatrics in the first quarter of next year. So that study will span several months. It'll begin at the end of this year and extend to the beginning part of next year where we can stage the enrollment, first adults, then adolescents, and then pre-adolescents. So we've already had a good conversation with the FDA about the design of the study and what, what it would take, to, what the study ought to look like in order to feed in to the insulin-only biome and pancreas pivotal trial, which we'd like to begin in the second half of next year. And in addition, in addition to that, we'd like to get this bioremolal study started in the first quarter of next year, which means we want to submit the application in the fourth quarter of this year for the bioremolal bridging study. This, this uh, is the only bridging study would involve something on the order of about 40 or 50 subjects with type 1 adults and peds down to 6 years of age. And the bioremolal bridging study would be adults only because it's a new drug. So we would have to start with adults and work our way down systematically into the pediatric population. And so this study, we'd like to submit that application uh, in, in the fourth quarter, and that would involve somewhere in the order of 60 to 70 subjects. Uh, but again, these are short duration studies. They're on the order of, of weeks rather than months, whereas the pivotal trials are on the order of months. And there may be even longer duration exposure needed for the bio arm for that glucagon. So these are the studies that we are, we are queuing up for with this new bio. And these are the clinical sites that we have, uh, we've uh, conscripted to do all this work. So there's going to be 16 clinical sites across the country. Uh, on this, this map may have changed a little bit since last year, particularly right here. So we have a, another a new pediatric site in D.C. I felt like we had a big hole in the mid-Atlantic region there. And so we've added a new site in Washington, D.C. So we're really looking forward to that collaboration uh, there. So these, these orange dots are what we call our regional coordinating centers. So we naturally break up the U.S. just in a couple of four different provisions, uh, right? We have the Northeast and Southeast Coast. And each region has its own regional coordinating center. Stanford, Colorado, and the Moors. Three other sites report to that center. Are, they're, they're audited by that center. They're, they're trained. And then, of course, the entire study is going to be uh, I have oversight by the, the uh, J Center for Health Research. 
Um, so now I'd like to just talk a little bit about the big one. So I mentioned this company at um, Friends for Life for the first time last year. We announced it in April of 2016, but we actually incorporated it in, in uh, the fall of 2015. And there was a lot of soul searching that went into how do we build a company that could commercialize this. And as I may have, may have said before, uh, some of you may have heard me talk about this, my initial intent was the, you know, to develop these algorithms. Firas was the, was the well, Firas al was right over there, <laughs> uh, was, the, uh, was the guy who really started the development of these algorithms as a PhD student at, when we were together at the University of Illinois. So he was a PhD student of mine who was focusing on developing these algorithms and testing them in pig. Uh, and then we brought it to human studies and so forth. We both moved to Boston University. But our intent is really to develop these algorithms and then license the technology to a big net tech. And as we got deeper into the weeds on this, and we started looking at how that would actually happen practically, we didn't see a good path forward for that. We saw there a good likelihood that that would not be a successful path forward. The, the, the technology that we developed, the ambition we the baked into those algorithms, would, would ultimately be undermined, would ultimately be a pan if we were to just license this off. We really thought we needed a whole new model. And that doesn't mean just um, a new approach to the technology, but a new business model, a new, a new approach to executing this business. I don't know anything about business. I was, not, I was trained to, you know, I'm an applied mathematician. But I started to look at, at different ways we could do this. And, and for a long time, not that long, but since 2012, this idea of a benefit corporation was attractive to me. I was also thinking about doing this as a nonprofit. I got a lot of advice from that. I spoke to Howard Mope about that. He has done a wonderful job with high pool as a nonprofit. But the amount of money and the resources we could raise to build a technology was diminished. Donations were just not going to be enough to do it. So ultimately, with the help of Ed and Serafina Raskin and Gib Clark, we put together this, this con concept of a benefit corporation. A benefit corporation, a new construct. Was it's only been around for about half a dozen years. There are now 30 states in the years that have Massachusetts is one of them. We would be particularly delighted for Massachusetts. But ultimately, we incorporated as a benefit corporation, and we have a benefit mission, which means that we are obliged under Massachusetts law to serve that benefit mission. We have a benefit director by the name of Jeff Hitchcock. He's our benefit director. And we have a benefit officer in Ed Raskin on management. And in addition to that, we have this benefit mission, which we articulate in our articles of incorporation of corporate bylaws. That's all on our uh, that's all on our charter. You can read about that online. We are also a certified B Corp. So in addition to having this commitment to a benefit mission, in fact, as a benefit corporation, unlike a traditional C Corp, we are not obliged to return equity to shareholders as our primary objective. We can prioritize our benefit mission, which is exactly what we're going to do. And above and beyond all other considerations is is putting the type 1 diabetes community at the center. I mean, it's first and foremost to serve the type 1 diabetes community, good community, and return of equity and ship to shareholders is not our primary objective. We're protected the law uh, to be able to structure our company and run our company that way. But we're also certified B Corp, so a third party uh, audit has been done by this nonprofit B Lab. Um, and, and, and evaluated our company and our benefit mission. It doesn't have to be a nonprofit or a for profit entity. It can be, it can be either my nonprofit or a for profit, a benefit corp or not. We happen to be a benefit corporation that is also uh, a, a, a B Corp. It's very similar to like whole food certification you'll see on your foods, um, these kinds of, of certifications that you'll, you know, fair trade certifications, these kinds of things. Third party independent evaluation of our benefit to show that we are serving our benefit. And we received this certification this year. So we're not only a benefit corporation, we're also a certain. We've also structured our company such that our, our investors are coming from strategic partnerships. And right now, we, we our strategic partnerships with the type 1 diabetes community. We've raised a million dollars in regulation crowdfunding through, uh, through an initiative that we, we did in 2016. In about 12 weeks, we raised the maximum that could be raised in a year, which was, 12, which was a million dollars, across about 700 investors. So this is the first time in 80 years in this country you could, you could invest in a private company and be an unaccredited investor and have 700 shareholders. They have bionics. Many of those people have personal. And the other two strategic partners are Lilly and Nova. So because we're a benefit corporation, it's extremely important that we have, you know, that our platform embrace both of their drug, drug portfolios. 
that we don't have preference of what to do. So we are a benefit corporation. Is, is we, we, are, we are not backed by venture capital or private equity investors. It's very difficult forward. We're not accountable to the VCs because we don't have them. So we have a tremendous amount of control in the execution of our business model. So I want to quickly update you on beta bionics and then finish up with some updates on beta bionics. So we incorporated beta bionics in October 2015, on, uh, on uh, October 21st, in fact, which is obviously back to today, which was. Um, and we executed intellectual property license agreement with BU in December. We executed, uh, so basically all the, all the technology was licensed out of BU by the end of December. And then we executed a transaction agreement with Lilly and raised $5 million in that, in that transaction. That was our first working capital going into it. So we only had just a handful of employees then. We entered into this strategic partnership with, uh, with Zealand as well and announced that at ADA last year in June in New Orleans. And so if you draw a line right here, that's where we were when I last spoke to this group at Friends for Life. So we've gotten a lot done. Soon after that, September was a huge month for us. We closed our regulation crowdfunding, which is actually going on. We just launched it at Friends for Life around the time of the life story. Uh, soon after that, we're close to closing, actually. But that's, that, that crowdfunding is going on at Friends for Life. Last year, we closed that round of financing $2 million in September. We also um, received huge uh, encouragement from the NIH because uh, the major application that we submitted through my lab at Boston University to the NIH supplement was, was funded by the NIH that added to a $1.5 million small grant that we had to do some of these early studies with the bionic Island was supplemented with $12 million in that announcement. So now we have this $13.5 million. It's not beta bionics money. It's money that beta bionics doesn't have to raise. It's money to fund clinical trials to test the island of the insulin only viral configuration in those 16 sites. Those clinical sites are, are in, in that in the contract with that money. That, that award was made to Boston University in September of last year as well. So I didn't I couldn't announce that a year ago because that hadn't that hadn't happened. And similarly, that also in September, we executed a transaction agreement with Onordis for $5 million like Lily did. So think about that for a minute. We're a benefit corporation. We're a certified B Corp. We're a medical technology company right there. I think that's unique, right? But on top of that, we have Lily and Novo Nordis as the chief strategic partners and investors in Beta Bionics. We have a board member who sits on our board from Lily and a board member who sits on our board. I think that's probably unique. So we have this sort of United Nations board of directors. Um, as I mentioned, the Zealand Pharma uh, uh, MGHBU collaboration began this uh, phase two trial testing of biopancreas on the BU platform back in December. And those, those top line results were just announced uh, in June, uh, uh, right after the ADA meeting, uh, so just last month. And uh, we then also started a whole new operation on the West Coast. So now we have an office in, in Irvine, California. Which we refer to as Beta Bionics West. That's where the Raskins were parked. And then we started to bring in a lot of talent from Southern California. A lot of talent over there. And Ed Raskin's idea was let's not uh, try and relocate everyone to Boston where you know we had 10 feet of snow in six weeks in 2015, <laughs> but rather consider the other coast as well. There's a lot of talent in Southern California, which is where they are. So we're able to access a lot of that and meet the talent where they live. So we actually have a bit of a distributed company now. We have a beta bionics east and a beta bionics west, where beta bionics east were responsible for things like regulatory, clinical, FDA interactions. We're responsible for a ton of systems and software systems, graphics user interface, um, uh, back end, you know, for the to support our cloud service. On the West Coast, we're we're, we're, we're responsible for um, be respons they're responsible for mechanical, uh, mechanicals, electricals, uh, software design, and of course uh, manufacturing, uh, distribution. So that's going to come out of Bay Bionics West in Southern California. So with uh, the formation of Bay Bionics West, we brought on we bringing on Michael Zenko, Don Lubov, and Joe Conkey. Uh, we started this, this official second office. We have about 2,000 square feet or so on the West Coast, and we're looking to scale that up considerably with some manufacturing warehouse space in the next uh, in the next several months before the end of the year. So we're really excited about growing the facility and the team on both coasts, but particularly with what's going on on the West Coast. Um, and uh, we received these certificate certifications I mentioned in January. 
who we hired off at the day by us. He's John Costick, who's in Rochester, New York. Uh, he's here with us today as well. Uh, he came on board in March, and he's a senior software engineer. So he's helping with all kinds of things related to our mobile platforms, our, our cloud support, uh, communication with uh, CGN, and so forth. And Scott Pollock came on and made a lot less on the same week, in fact, as our technical lab manager. Um, we also finished, and uh, uh, this study finished uh, in April, uh, the Zealand Pharma study finished, both of the phase two H studies finished, and top line results that I mentioned were announced in April, and again in June, uh, about those two studies. And finally, we just brought on Denise Brown and Justin Brown, Denise is a senior software tester, and Justin is a principal engineer at Beta Linux West. So, and we have one more employee coming on board in about four days at Beta Linux West as well. So we're growing out a lot of the technical talent that we need to move this forward. So, uh, and this is just when people came on board and what their, their titles on. Uh, this is the way that the timeline is. So what I'd like to finish with is talking about what we've done on the device side since we were last here. So a lot has been going on over the past 12 months on the iOS side. And a lot more could happen because of the expertise that we brought in on the West Coast, much more than, than I really thought. And so in particular, if you may recall, we announced for the very first time this idea of a fully integrated system that we were going to take ownership of at this conference two years ago in this venue with the Coronado Springs Resort 2015. It was the first time we introduced our vision of what the graphical user interface would look like. We worked closely with Tidepool uh, in the development of this graphical user interface on an early version of the device that was built around a 3NL glass pen cartridge that Eli Lilly provides. Um, back then, we, were, we, were, we hadn't really engaged yet with Zealand Pharma. It's just two years ago. A lot happens in 24 months. This thing was very, a very large platform. You can see how big it was. It was almost 250 uh, centimeters. Um, it, was, you know, it was 14 centimeters long. It had BTLE and a resistive touchscreen. We didn't see this as a commercial product. We saw it as our first prototypical system that showed a fully integrated system and how this would work. And it would have involved a pre-filled insulin cartridge and a glucagon cartridge you filled with care. Because at that point we didn't know where how far how much progress the had made and others who are making progress in developing stable pumpable glucagon analogs and glucagon or how many glucagons. So we were building this thing around the concept of the Zealand glucagon where you have to fill the cartridge. But then a lot changed. Uh, in particular, um, uh, last year, by, by the time we came to this conference a year ago, we moved to this, built out this new design, which we call the Gen 3 Islet. The Gen 1 Islet with Islet is just a prototype system, a, lab, a bench top system. But the Gen 3 Islet, which is what I showed for the first time a year ago, that system, again, powered by two AAA power batteries, went to a capacitive touch, made a very nice memory LCD, sharp display. Um, it had a USB port as well as BTLE, you know, Bluetooth, low energy Bluetooth. Uh, it, it used this, this pump cart product from Novo Nordisk, which is a, a they sell Novo Log, it's called Novo Rapid over there, in a little 1.6 ml glass cartridge. And we worked with Novo Nordisk uh, around the time they were making their investment in Beta Bionics to build a cartridge that, that cartridge is compatible with this version of the Islet, and it's something that we, they allow us to work with them to build a fillable one. In the US, pump cart's not available, but we made the cartridge, an identical cartridge to pump cart in the US that you can fill at the point of care like a regular reservoir that you would use in the scenarios. So uh, they were extremely collaborative and cooperative with that. We were really thrilled at the, the extent to which they were willing to let us do that because you know, we're going to be putting drugs in there that aren't just theirs. Their competitor's drug will go in that cartridge as well. So the other thing that happened, of course, to allow us to move to this much smaller platform, as you can see, dramatically reduced in volume, was that we were able to work with Zealand to develop a cartridge that's pre-filled that's only 1 ml, a tiny little glass cartridge. That pre-filled cartridge goes in one chamber here, and then the pump cart product or a ready-to-fill insulin cartridge would go in the other. That was a huge change. You had a sea change in the whole design of this thing. And now the insulin cartridge would be available and the glucagon cartridge would be pre-filled. Um, and then finally, um, a lot happened actually in the last year to go from the 3.1 island to go to this system. In this system, now we brought a lot of the alarms and alerts online. The cartridge detection is now enabled. We now have a backlight. This system is going to come online this quarter. We should have these, the, uh, you know, the 140 pieces we're ordering for this that we should have at hand in the next several months. Um, and this will go into that fourth quarter study that we want to do, the insulin diversion study. It's got dual band Bluetooth, standard and, and low energy Bluetooth. We've got rid of the USB port. Uh, it's got a capacitive touchscreen, and it's 
about 139 centimeters, a little bit thicker. And that's the study we're going to be using in the bridging study. But when Michael Siegel came on board, he's now our VP for R&D at Beta Virus West, you know, he sort of challenged us. He looked at this thing and he said, this is nice. You know, it's very nice. But um, can we do better? Can we put our best foot forward without compromising the timeline? As it is, our timeline slipped, mainly because the project is, is just so big. There are so many moving pieces. Our contract manufacturers are helping us build this technology underestimated the project, and we are a little bit further behind the thought. We underestimate the project. We did our best not to, but it happens. But it's important to be ambitious. It's important to push the envelope, so we did. And with the, 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 this slide in the timeline, we also felt like, you know, can we, can we do a better job? So he sort of, sort of probing us and pushing us and thinking about a, a more waterproof system, a smaller system, more robust, more manufacturable. We weren't really designing this with manufacturability in mind, so we just didn't have the bandwidth and experience to do it. But with the expertise that's been coming on board at the one one our West Coast office, we thought maybe we could get a second generation device out as our first generation. These guys have collectively many, many years, decades even, collectively of experience in this. And so all, all the successes they had were benefiting from. And in any failings that came in those first designs, they can help us avoid now. And together we can build a much better system, a much smaller system, a much more robust system. One that's designed with manufacturability in mind, one that can be made much less expensive, much more cheaply, much more expensive. Smaller, more serviceable, more reliable. And so what we're going to show you today is a prototype system which we want to bring online as an operational device by the end of this year. And it's the Gen 4 pilot. And this is what it looks like. So this device, this device is a prototype which I have here in my pocket, and it is way smaller than the Gen 3 Island. It's about almost half the size. It's about 57% the size. And just to give you an idea, this is the old iPhone, original iPhone. I bought one of these things on eBay because I talk about these things so much. <laughs> Ten years ago, this thing came out. And the Gen 4 Island looks like this. So that's how it stands up against the old iPhone. This device is about, about 25 grams lighter than the Gen 3 Island when it's fully loaded, but it's about 57% the size of the Gen 3 Island. And it's a much more robust system. I just wanted to show you a couple of highlights about it. And by the way, I should probably show you what it looks like relative to this device we were looking at last year. So this is the Gen 3 Island, right? So you can see it's much thinner. It's now 15 millimeters thin, as they like to say, right? So it's a very thin device. This would be thinner than any insulin pump on the market today. And um, just to give you an idea of what this device would look like, so it has, it's down to 80 cubic centimeters. So it's a very tiny little device. So if anybody ever tells you that a biomolecular system is really big and clumsy, um, I beg to differ because this device would be smaller than any insulin pump that's currently on the market with the exception of the T-Slim and thinner than any insulin pump that's on the market currently including the T-Slim. Um, it will use again our, our ready to fill 1.6 ml glass cartridge or the, the 1.6 ml glass pump cart product. Uh, it'll, have, it'll, it'll be compatible with the 1 ml glass, uh, uh, glass cart glucagon cartridge has the exact same capacitive touchscreen and the same graphical user interface. That was kind of the stake in the graph. We want to redo that beautiful graphical user interface all the time and resources that went into that. That ports right over to the same screen. It's just that we got rid of the rest of the device. We got rid of that whole vessel. And now we have this curved, wrapped around glass over the entire front of this thing, which will have much better, promote much better wireless communication to CGM than anything we think that is out there because you get this nice curved glass front up here where we can put all these antennas and have a much better uh, wireless communication. Uh, again, it has this, it'll have a capacitive touchscreen, same exact backlight, same technology. This one is going to be powered by a rechargeable battery, 500 milliamp hour battery. So we're hoping to get a, a much better battery life out of this device. And also one that's environmentally friendly. But with, by separating the, the cartridges as we have, it opened up this huge real estate for a large printed circuit board and a very large battery. And we want to try and make this device not only as robust as we can, as sturdy as we can, but a device that could potentially be much more waterproof than anything we've seen with, uh, with, uh, with our own device, way more waterproof than that. Um, and so we're going to try and push down to what we can get there. 
We also want a device that's much more reliable with one single large printed circuit board in the middle with these cartridges separated like this. We don't have we don't have a lot of the, uh, of the reliability issues you have with uh, with multiple circuit boards like we would have in the Gen 3 system. It's much cheaper to manufacture as well. This is designed with manufacturability in mind. And um, we think that this is also it is, it will be it will also be very serviceable and scalable. And that's something we just didn't we couldn't you know spread ourselves that thin and, and think about all those considerations. I was always thinking of the Gen 2 commercial system to address so so many of the limitations of our Gen 3 system. Um, but I think this device will do it coming right out of the starting blocks. Um, so this will have a dual band Bluetooth, so all the input output of this device will go through the radio as opposed to USB-C. So again, we've eliminated the USB-C port in this device. And I can advance the slide. Oh, yeah, this is a nice slide. It just shows you some of the overall dimensions, and you can see we're down to 80 cubic <laughs> centimeters here, and you can see what the dimensions of, say, the Animus pump is around 92, so it's about 87% of the size of the Animus pump. It's 57% the size of the Gen 3 alloy. It's quite a bit smaller than these Medtronic 670 products. And the thinnest dimension here would be the T-Slim, and now the, the Gen 4 alloy is around 15 millimeters. This will be a rechargeable battery. Right now, our goal is to make this rechargeable with an inductive recharging pad. That's the way we'd like to do that. A nice big piece of real estate in the back for an inductive coil. <clears throat> and finally, we have a really big display, right? It's a, it's a very nice large display with a small form factor, so that's kind of a tension, right? You have a device that is, you want to make it as small as possible to the display as big as possible. So I think we've had a good compromise there. We're filling the entire front of this thing uh, with a really nice, uh, very nice form factor. It's going to look like a modern piece of wearable electronics. So, the last thing I want to finish with, oh, I'm running a little bit over, so I just want to finish with the, uh, our island mobile. So John Acostic is hard at work helping us build out a full mobile platform, so of course this device is going to talk to your watch, it's going to talk to your phone, uh, and you're going to be able to see this thing remotely. So the island mobile is going to have a personal use interface where you can look at our status screen like we have on the island on the phone, or you can toggle between that and the, uh, and the uh, graph screen here. So we'll pull the status buttons up showing an insulin cartridge, blue gun cartridge, uh, capacities and what's what's you know what's left in those cartridges, the CGM status, uh, infusion set status, and the batteries. And you also see the graph for your glucagon, your CGM, and your insulin glucagon dosing here. But there'll also be a remote monitoring, uh, a remote monitoring capability where you can follow a number of people and then just click on any one of these people, and you can get the same kind of information that you would see uh, in the personal use uh, in the personal use application. And similarly, we will. Um, we will also uh, deploy this on the watch as well, where you can potentially talk directly from the island to the watch without needing to, uh, to have a phone either. So we'll have a, a simple interface here where you can watch. If, you, if you're if you do using personal use, you can see the status screen. You can switch over to the graph screen. If you are following somebody, it'll be a third screen. You can switch to the, to follow the individual as well. So we're working on building out this whole mobile platform as well. So I want to finish by just uh, mentioning that our team's grown. And this is a picture we took at Friends for Life last year, and that was our team, Sans one guy, Gib, who would be right here if he were in this picture. <laughs> took the picture. He's here today. And uh, so, unfortunately, we were missing Gib this picture. But that was the team a year ago that was taken at the Marriott World Resort. And I just want to emphasize that, um, you know, this is not something, that none of us on this team can build Biomech networks. Not a single one of us can do this. The only way this can happen is if we, are, we do it as a collective whole team does this because we all have all these different skill sets. And the thing that's so beautiful about this project is not one of us has the skills to do this thing. But together we can build this amazing technology. And now I think we finally got the expertise that will allow us to do it. And this is where our team stands today. So we are 16, soon to be 17 strong. And this is a picture taken this morning at our booth. And uh, that's growing as well. And all of this uh, new, these new technology, I didn't mention infusion set, but we've also gotten a lot of input from our uh, industrial designers uh, on the infusion set, so we've made some improvements there. You can see all the new technologies at our new podium there. So this podium wasn't here yesterday. So tomorrow, go by the booth, and you'll see the Gen 4 island next to the Gen 3 island. You'll see our new infusion set designs. Injection molded parts are all, um, will be in our hands in another four weeks or so, all through biocompatibility. Uh, so you can start to see what these things are really going to look like. And I would like to just close by having the whole team come up, since this is a team effort in, its, in, in the literal sense. It, the whole body of the Venus team can come on up here and introduce uh, yourself.
questions, feel, feel free to do so unless we got to get out of this room. There's a mic up here if you want to come up. What did we buy? What did you buy? <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> of course, naturally. So the timeline that we're laying out is our best estimate of what we can do. So the question is, when can you buy it? Um, our, we can't tell you that for sure. Mm -hmm. What we can say is that our goal is to start these bridging studies in the, in the end of this year, beginning of next year. And depending on how well that goes, and if there's any, any iteration or refinement that needs to happen, we'll dictate when we can get into that pivotal trial. But our goal is to be doing the pivotal trial with the insulin only system in the second half of next year. That study is looking to be about six months long for any given subject, but the actual trial would take a period of time to enroll. So you can budget about 10 to 12 months for that whole study. So we're hoping that we can put a package in front of the FDA for the insulin only system in about two years from now. Maybe two, two years, two and a quarter years or so. And then, you know, how fast will they turn it around? We don't know. But if they were to approve it, you know, it could potentially be something we could see at the end of 2019. They did, they approved the, uh, the Medtronic system in, in uh, 100 days. Will that happen in our case? I don't know. Uh, we'll have to see. But the bihormonal system is going to be a longer runway because you've got to have a chronic glucagon exposure. So some subset of our subject have to wear the device for longer than six months. That study could be 18 or 24 months because this is a new molecular entity um, that we're looking at with glucagon analogs. And uh, consequently, that there's a longer clinical exposure needed than, than, than typical. Uh, you know, at Glucagon, the Glucagon molecule. So that could be more like 2021. But we don't have, that we don't have a good view on. But right now we're focusing on trying to get uh, the insulin only system, um, you know, into these pivotal trials uh, second half of next year. I should also emphasize that we are very interested in, in Europe and other, other markets as well. So that's something that's going to also be happening as we approach the US regulatory bodies. We're going to be doing the same thing in Europe. So when that might happen, uh, well, relative to the U.S., you know, the U.S. Uh, regulatory process is unclear, but we're working on all those different fronts with a very small team. <laughs> small but energetic. <laughs> yeah? Will the insulin only system come with the glucagon capabilities for when that is approved? Yeah, exactly. It's, just, it's the same device, right? So the question was, will the insulin only system have the glucagon capabilities? It's all built in. It's just that there will be no glucagon in the chamber. So you'll have the second chamber for glucagon. We actually have a little cap. I didn't have an image of it, but there's a little, there'll be a little anodized aluminum cap that will thread on top of that, and you just keep it closed. The device will know that it's configured in the insulin-only system. You can, if you get the configuration, you can deliberately do that, or by virtue of the fact that there's no cartridge in there, it will automatically default to insulin-only. So there will be no firmware upgrades. There will be no hardware upgrades. As soon as the glucagon work would be would be approved, you'd pull that cap off, and you can start loading glucagon. So it's a truly turnkey. Yes. The decision-making device. Yes. So is there thought in keeping the backup? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, um, if I could just say it a slightly different way, what happens if people are doing? You've got an automated system here that's taking overall control. What happens is people get de-skilled, right? They're not controlling their their blood sugars anymore. They've forgotten how to do it. So we are very mindful of that. And we are going to use the device to help provide information back to you on those occasions when the device lets you down. And, and, and such occasions might be if the device breaks, right? If it falls, you know, it, 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 it's, it's some, somebody drives over in the car, you drop it, you lose it, whatever happens. You're, you're, somehow you're separated from your device. The device is able to, through its different, so our, our algorithms are constantly trying to predict you know, you're determining your, your basal infusion rates and store them, your uh, meal announcements, to the extent that you use meal announcements, which we encourage people to use with the device, it's learning what you mean by typical meal, large and typical, less than typical. Uh, while the device will regulate your blood sugar without meal announcements, it does a better job with them. And every time you, you use the meal announcement feature, it trains you on, you're training the device on what you mean by typical meals, so that when the system is offline, it can still help you. But when it's really gone, Right, it can pop, it, we, we will have the we will have the ability every every 24 hours to store what your total daily dose is, break that up in terms of basal usage and prandial insulin usage, so that you'll know how to at least go over to a standard of care therapy or an older therapy, an injection therapy or a pump therapy temporarily, and that data will be streamed to the cloud and updated every day. So it'll be telling you the latest, greatest estimates of what your total daily dose is, what your basal your daily basal rates are, and basal rate profiles, what your prandial insulin needs are roughly to get you through those period, that period until you can get hooked up to the island again. Uh, in the back of the room, I'm too, I'm being greedy. You guys are being greedy up front. <laughs> so, uh, 
I understand this correctly, the process allows for a more aggressive use of insulin because you have the glucagon brake pedal. Did your study show that uh, more insulin is consumed? And as a result, as a follow-up question, our insurance company is going to follow you and say, yes, we will cover more insulin on this system if you're going to use, you know, no use is less on a teaspoon. Right. So essentially, if you couldn't hear, the question was that are we, do we use more insulin with the biomolecule system, the insulin only system? And our clinical data show that we don't use more insulin on the biomolecule system than usual care. Nor do we see a difference in the amount of insulin that's used between our insulin only system and usual care. So there was no statistically significant difference in the insulin consumption in our preteens or our teens in summer camp. There was a, a slight statistical significant increase in our uh, total daily dose used in the biomolecule system in our home use study. But when you did a retrospective analysis, it was only those four people that had, that were under insulinized that had the highest mean glucose under usual care that caused that, that difference to, to arise. So what that means is that it added more insulin exactly differentially for those people who needed it without knowing. So the population that was getting, you know, good had mean glucose levels below 200, there was no statistically significant difference. So from an insurance provider standpoint, you're not consuming more drug. Yeah. What was the target you were using for all the studies? All the studies? How much time do you have? <laughs> so we have, we, but basically the biomolecule system has lower targets that will allow than the insulin only for obvious reasons. The lowest target we've tested in the biomolecule system is 100, and that produces a mean glucose of about 150. But we've tested the biomolecule system at 115, at 100, 110, 110, 115, 120, 130. To follow up, what are you going to recommend as a target? So what we're going to do is we're not actually going to release, we're not going to reveal what the target is. We're going to recommend a default target, and you can choose a higher or lower target relative to it. The default target that we're shooting for right now, that we're, that we're considering to configure the system with, would be about 110 for insulin only for bioimmunal and 120 for uh, for insulin only. And then you can go up or down relative to that in, in, in ranges that we've tested in clinical trials. So you'll be able to adjust that, make that, that change 24-7. Some people like to see, see the target go higher, and they still get great control because they might be making a little bit of insulin. Others need a more aggressive lower target. Maybe they, they just need more, more insulin, or they just, they're, just, they, they're, they are, they're more challenging from a glycemic perspective. So you have this ability to adjust your target 24-7. You'll also be able to use recurring targets. So if you only want the target to be high in the window, you can configure the system to do that as well. And finally, you can run a temporary target, where if you're going to exercise with the insulin-only system, you might want to raise that target a little bit. So like if the kid goes to camp, then You can just the adjust the target that way. So you're not adjusting basal rates, you're adjusting the target of the system, and then it'll increase or decrease its, its aggressiveness relative to that target. Yes? Any concerns for system security? Yes, huge concerns for system security. And it's, it's an area that we're very sensitive to. I think we have some good, really good expertise on our team, but we are happy to reach out and get more expertise. And I think the T1D community can introduce that and provide that if we need it. But uh, security is a major issue for us, and we want to make a, a cipher secure system as much as is possible. So we're putting a great deal of thought into that. And we do feel like the industry needs to work harder at this. I don't, I don't think we're where we need to be with these wireless systems, and I'm hoping that we can add a level of security uh, that is that is hopefully sets a precedent. But that is very much on our radar. Yes? Is there any sort of calibration protocol? When you say calibration protocol, is there? Do we need any sort of intervention for calibrating, calibrating the pump itself? Not calibrating the pump sensor, yes. Or this, the, 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 the intent is for the Gen 4 IL to be compatible with the G6 Dexcom, right? But from a cal calibrating the pump, I guess my answer to that would be the only information you need to provide it is to initialize it as your body weight. And that's not something you have to continuously check and refine as your body weight changes. It just puts it in the ballpark. Just, just the sensor. Yeah, the sensor will require calibration. You know, unless you're using a factory calibrated sensor. But right now, the sensors that show the best performance are those that require calibration in the field. Yes? Yeah, considering uh, how this is set up and who's on the board of directors, is it good you guys should be a pretty lucrative uh, absorption target down the road? Does it get a public benefit company? It doesn't prevent it, but it allows us to to not do that if we so choose. And so we are we are not flipping this company. Okay, this is a very important question because we're a public benefit corporation. 
Um, it, does it protect us from acquisition, from, from flipping it, from pressures to flip the company to make an exit? And the way I like to think about these, these exits is uh, you know, flipping companies for an exit to, to, to make a windfall is that kind of, that kind of profit motive is uh, abandonment for the sake of profit taking. It's a euphemism for that, right? And there's nothing wrong with profit taking, it's just that we don't abandon the T1D community because we're part of it. So to flip this company would put it right back into the same boat I thought we were in, we would be in if we were to just, if we were to just license the technology to med tech companies that already exist. I don't see a way for that anybody to do it as well as we're gonna do it. And so we don't see an opportunity to sell it. We don't want to sell it, we keep it in the family. So that was part of the reason we wanted to do this as a public benefit corporation, because we have that kind of control over it. So we don't have that pressure. Time? Oh, I the boss has said we must if, stop. If people have kids today in Canada, they gotta go. Yeah. Oh, so those of you that have kids have to go. <laughs> <laughs> Mine are 18 and 20. I just did. So if you have any questions, you don't have kids. <laughs> Well, when you say waterproof, how waterproof are you talking about? We don't know yet. So we don't know how waterproof we can make it, but we think this design is much more amenable to it, okay. to a waterproof system or much so more thank waterproof. You. So thank you. Swimming, scuba diving? I mean, I'd love to go do that. <laughs> Talk to us in another year. Okay. We'll go no more. And um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're considering having the thing actually broken, you have some other way of getting information? More information. Well, like, like if the thing's broken, you have to go back to self-managing? Yes. So you think you need a website or something like that for that? What was the last part? You have a website or some other way of doing Yeah, that. so basically the data, the, this data updating what your what your standard of care therapy regimen would be is something we can update to the cloud service daily. So you can always pull that down and say that device is changing for the next two days. What is my therapy? And it will, it will advise you. We're actually going to build that into the pivotal trial. So we'll send people home on that therapy and compare how it does for a subset that goes back to the usual therapy. So we have to device. maintain an account that you've already in the past when you get into the recommendation. Yes. Yes. Um, the choice to go to rechargeable battery, was that a size that to, to help bring the size down? Because I have a big concern about that. Yes. So why did we go to rechargeable battery? Well, go, you know, rechargeable battery, there's reasonable batteries that there's pros and cons. Anyway, you look at that. that I mean, we travel, you know, uh, uh, with, you know, and everybody has a rechargeable battery in their phone. Right. And you know what that's like, uh, you know, cords or whatever. You're never more than a few minutes away from that's a handful true. of double A's. That's true. You know? So part of it was driven by how much power we can get. And it's a very old-fashioned technology, these AAA batteries, that are not very efficient form factor. And it really did drive the size of this thing, for sure. It also offers an opportunity for ingress, right? Because you now have a little seal that you've got to deal with. Uh, so that's a challenge for, for waterproofing. It's something to lose, you know, these little caps. I've already lost the, the caps on this thing a couple of times. So there are other ways to get around that potentially through design considerations. But um, the AAA battery thing was a, was, it was a difficult discussion for us. But when we saw what we could do with the form factor, that was a very compelling argument. I think that, you know, the, there's a lot of experience out there now with the Tandem Pump, which is a rechargeable platform. That uses a USB cable. Um, but I think they've had really good success with that. My son's been wearing it too. And these rechargers are, are pretty ubiquitous these days. So it's, 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 there's always a tension there. But we were just seduced by what we could do with, with, uh, with this form factor by moving to this very large factor, you know, a million pound pound. With that big piece of real estate now accumulated in the center, mm -hmm. separating the cartridges, we have so much opportunity. So, you know, there's pros and cons in the way you look at these things. And I have the same concern. Okay. Yes? You know, you have crowdfunding, you've got money for another different source. you got, you know, give or take 40 years before this is going to maybe be out in production or, you know, how's the money source going to keep coming to keep these guys employed and making this happen? It's a good question. I mean, we certainly haven't raised enough money to bring this thing to market. So we have another round of financing to do and perhaps more than that, obviously. So that is our job, right? Part of our job is to bring in financial resources to keep this, this operation going. And we're going to do that. We have, we have lots of ideas about how to move forward. The kinds of fundraising opportunities and when to do that are very much in our minds. And it's a strategy like any other part of the business that we've been, uh, we've been you know, evolving over the past few years and, and looking forward to the next couple of years to do that. Yeah. And, you know, we, like many of us, we've been tracking and watching this and your presentation years over year. Yeah. Extremely exciting. You guys have done an awesome job. Um, 
the question that I have is I think you originally had a track and here's something that's going to go to knowledge. If that was the goal, try to have it. And it looked like you're pretty well on track with your FDA testing, et cetera. You know that things get scratched, things happen. Yeah. So does any of the delay have anything to do with the fact that the model is being re-engineered or designed? Could it have come sooner? Right. Excellent question. Yeah. So the question is, if we hadn't been redesigning it, Gen 1, Gen 2, Gen 3, Gen 4, would we have been able to get a Gen 2 out earlier? And the answer is no, not the generations that we've developed. We thought that that Gen, I was hopeful that that Gen 3 was something that could have, could have, would, would be our first step forward. Yeah. And it's possible that that was a device that could have, 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 uh, have, done, have done that. But it turns out that we, we've really done a lot of work over the past year redesigning the software, the embedded systems on that device to make it much better than the device we were looking at last year. And I don't think the device last year really was able to, to go to a pivotal trial. It just wasn't, it was nowhere near what needed to happen. And I, I was hopeful that the contract manufacturers we were working with would really be able to, to get that done and, and, and improve that the reliability of those software systems in a shorter period of time than they were able to. So what we've done instead is we said, well, let's make these software improvements. And every, all these improvements we're making between the Gen 3.1 and the 3.2 are going to be inherited by the Gen 4 system. So it's not setting us back, and we're developing these things in parallel. So the Gen 4 system is being developed with our own resources and some additional uh, consulting resources we've been able to bring in on the industrial design side, on the mechanical engineering side, that have helped us keep that mo moving while we're making progress on the Gen 3 system. So we don't see one as really attacking the timeline too badly uh, and compromising the timeline. It's just that to make a really truly robust system like we're hoping to develop, it took more time than we needed and our contractors also underestimated the job. So I just think that reality started to hit over the past you know, 12 months that there's no way this is going to be done by the time P. David goes to college. That's another problem. <laughs> but it did, having that goal, I think, really helped move us and motivate us and incentivize us. Well, the software that you had, that you demonstrated, and the, and the reaction of the, the, the people that were part of your clinical trials, I mean, listening to them, literally in tears that they had to give it back at the end, yeah. it sounded like it was right there other than the glucagon. guy. And I think that's why... Yeah, but th th those very same people are responding to an iPhone system that was still very a, very, a nuisance device. It was very cumbersome, yeah. you know? And so there was a lot of support to keep those wireless communications going between the devices. It was not an easy system to manage. It required a lot of support. Even though it was making all the management decisions, it required a lot of maintenance. So we're trying to build a system that's as, as, as maintenance-free as possible, albeit not completely. Uh, but that all that management autonomy, we're building into it. So it's just, it's a big project. It's got a lot of moving parts, you know? Yes? It's David studying. So David is going to Boston University. He's going to study history and international relations is what he's looking to do. So he just got really good news about two AP exams. He got scores yesterday. He sent texted me the results. So he's probably got some extra credit. He is probably do two majors. And I think those are the two things he's thinking about. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> yes? Have conversations already begun about the payers for this device? No, we haven't engaged directly payers yet. We do need to do that. That's going to be a big part of what we're going to be doing over the next 24 months. But for the ILET system, we need to collect clinical data to make that case to payers. And so, you know, while we, I've, had, I've had conversations with payers at a fairly superficial level to really dig down and start talking to these payers in different regions, that, has, that conversation hasn't happened by, with us. Others have, of course, who are making semi-automated systems, hybrid systems. So those conversations have started, and we will we'll add to that discussion. But right now, I would say we haven't had a concerted effort to do that. I will emphasize, though, that those 16 clinical sites, I think, are going to be the nucleus um, of, of the conversations we have in each of those 16 regions. So there are a lot of different pairs across the country, and they all have their own quirks, and, 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 uh, and, and we have to get to know how they, how they work, how they think. And so that nuance has to be worked out, and we thought we would, we would approach these different 16 sites and the pairs that are, are, are located in those locales and begin discussions with them first before engaging payers you know, nationally. So I think those, those 16 sites are going to be good focal points for us to begin those discussions and help focus our attention on the right payers initially and then broaden that as, as time goes on. Yes? What's a payer? 
What's a payer? Oh, uh, insurance provider. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, yeah, insurance provider. Okay. Other questions? Yes? Uh, yeah, I don't see how we could do that because if you're on a pump company, it's one pump company sold to a pump and you're all using that platform. I don't know that, you know, we would have to pay for that transition. So I've never considered how we would finance a thing like that, right? Because you would, your insurance provider would have paid for a pump for you, say, for four years. And maybe you're one year into that or two years into that. Uh, you're not going to be entitled to then, you know, uh, get another pump. So I, I'm not sure how that would work. There's a possibility that the device, if, 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 if we show better clinical outcomes, I could I can envision a scenario where payers may be motivated to move you over to because it will save them money over the remainder of your contract with them with that warranty period. So that might happen, and we'll certainly propose those discussions, but we can't promise uh, buying out that contract or whether or not payers would do that, but it's certainly a discussion we're going to have because if we can show significantly better clinical outcomes and a dramatic reduction in cost, they may want you to transition over to technology that's more autonomous and gets better, better therapeutic outcomes. So that conversation is part of the whole discussion that we need to have uh, going forward with uh, insurance providers. Any other questions? Yes? Where would you wear the uh, little box part this of little, it? This little guy? Where would you wear it? Well, it's getting easier to answer that question, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, a number of places. Your pocket is the first obvious choice, right? But a lot of people and don't have pockets. Have tubes. Uh, yeah, with like an insulin pump, right? You're going to have to figure out creative ways to manage the tubes, right? We'll have two tubes if you're on the bihormonal system, or one if you're on the insulin only or glucagon system. So that tube management is still going to be a, a pesky part of, of wearing a device like this. Some people wear it in their bra strap. This would be this is a this is thinner than any insulin pump on the market, so it'll fit up there pretty nicely. Um, you can wear it in. Uh, we get a clip. We, we're thinking about talk. We talked to uh, some industrial designers about developing clips and other fastener straps that you can put on if you're doing it. Uh, you could be athletic. You're running. Hello. Hi. <laughs> so there's a number of ways to fasten it. We'll explore various options, but. We didn't go, right? Yeah. We've got a whole setup team out there in cowboy hats. Okay, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Come by the booth tomorrow and we'll look at some of these new devices and components, okay?